defined as showing courage and resolve. Spark plug. Informally defined as a person who leads or inspires. Vincio makes it without a play at there. He went in hard, though. These are the first words used to describe Craig Vigio and the National Baseball Hall of Fame. It's the Hall of Fame. It doesn't get any better than that. I'm here for one reason. Craig Vigio. Coming up, we visit with the man these words help define. You either played his way, you played the Astro way, or you weren't an Astro very long. And hear from the teammates, mentors, and inspirational figures that help shape a young athlete from Long Island into a Houston sports icon who will forever be remembered for his work both on and off the field. This is Craig Vigia. Journey to Cooperstown. New York to Houston, Texas, from all-star catcher to gold glove second baseman to center fielder back to second base. Craig Biggio's Hall of Fame career has just about seen it all. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Eschenfelder, and welcome to Cooperstown, New York. You know, over 18,000 men have played the great game of Major League Baseball, but only 215 have been good enough to be enshrined here in the Hall of Fame here in Cooperstown. Coming up over the next half hour, we're going to take you through the induction of Craig Biggio, make you a part of his very special time here in Cooperstown, New York. It all starts with a look back at his Hall of Fame career. Raised in Smithtown, New York, Craig Allen Biggio was the 22nd overall player taken in the 1987 draft. A year later, he was in the big leagues with the Astros. He joined a veteran club that included the likes of Nolan Ryan, Mike Scott, Bill Doran, and Buddy Bell. I didn't speak much. I didn't say much. Just sit, listen, and learn, and observe, and hopefully, you, you know, you benefit from it. And uh, I did. Biggio made the first of seven all-star teams in 1991 before making a successful transition to second base the following season, where he would go on to win four Gold Glove Awards. And while Craig is known as a career-long Astro, as a free agent, he nearly left Houston following the 1995 season. I remember I went and sat in a church for four hours. I'm like, I don't want to leave, I don't want to leave, I don't want to leave. And then I don't have a choice anymore. They don't want to get the deal done. So we gave a team a chance, and then when we hung up with that team, another team called, and the right thing happened. Why didn't it get done earlier? <laughs> I have no idea. Fittingly, success with the Astros soon followed, making the first of six career trips to the playoffs in 1997. In 03, Craig once again showed his versatility, moving to center field, before moving back to second base to help lead the Astros to the 2005 World Series. That would be the last time Biggio would play in the postseason, but he continued to build his Hall of Fame resume. Line drive right center field, that's number 3,000. On June 28, 2007, Biggio became the 27th player in Major League history to reach that magical 3,000 hit plateau. And less than two weeks later, he was hit by a modern day record 285th pitch. Biggio played his last game on September 30th of that season, and fittingly enough, it was a double as his last hit in the big leagues. A total of 3,060 hits and 1,014 extra base hits. The five-time Silver Slugger Award winner retired as the first player in the history of the game to have at least 3,000 hits, 600 doubles, 400 stolen bases, and 250 home runs. If you look at the list of guys that have 3,000 hits and 1,000 extra base hits, um, that's a pretty small list. And then when you break it down to see how many guys were middle infielders, you know, Cal Ripken and, and myself are the only two middle infielders that have it. That's a pretty good company to be with. Finally, in January, Biggio got the call to Cooperstown. In his third year of eligibility, he was elected into the Baseball Hall of Fame. 
You talked to Craig's former teammates. You know, a couple things come to mind. They talk about how hard of a worker he is. They also talk about how he was a consummate team player. Uh, that was never more evident than after the 1991 season. After being an all-star catcher, they knew that the move had to be made to second base. The big reason why he's here in Cooperstown. It took a lot of hard work, and it ended up with four straight gold gloves. It was a tough call at the time because Biz was an all-star catcher. But I, I, we just needed him in the lineup more. I watched Biz goofing around during batting practice with his catcher's mitt, catching the ground balls as well as the infielders were with their gloves. And being such a great athlete, I just felt that it was a good fit. And Matt Galani deserves a ton of credit because he spent a lot of extra hours with him and Biz. We wore him out in the spring. I mean, he, he, he worked really hard. It's easy for us to say, but it was difficult for us to get Biz to do it. Uh, but once he agreed to do this, he went full force. We had six weeks to, for him to convert me in from an all-star catcher to a, you know, hopefully a productive defensive second baseman, right? And in the National League, if you don't, if you can't play defense, you're really not going to play, right? So we want to be as good as we want to be. But, I mean, it was one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do in my career. We were on the field at 730 on that turf field in Kissimmee, and we went to 845. And then we went right out. Right after our team workout, we went to the turf field again uh, in between lunchtime and the game. And then we played the game, and then we'd go back and do it. And we did it every day. We just wanted to get them through the day. We, we didn't think about the Hall of Fame. When you see players, and you know they're going to be good, you can never predict the Hall of Famer. When I won a gold glove, I gave it to him because it was like, dude, I mean, I, I he, that's why he deserved the standing ovation that he got because... I'm not here. I wasn't. I'm not in Cooperstown if it wasn't for him. So thank you for your awesome generosity to us. Because, You're welcome. You know, we wouldn't have a single thing in here if it, we couldn't depend upon the gener <laughs> generosity of not just players and teams, but fans as well. But you know, we do not purchase items we never had. We are everything that a game of baseball. Everything that we've been able to accomplish on the field and the things that we have off the field is, is all because of the game of baseball. So we always felt that as far as, you know, a brotherhood, that the Hall of Fame wants something on your, your stuff. You, <laughs> you can have it, you know, because it's the Hall of Fame. It doesn't get any better than that. I grew up on a cattle ranch in South Central Oklahoma and tried to listen to baseball every night on the radio and I could only pick up the Colt 45s on KWKH out of Shreveport. And here we are a few years later so getting to see BGO go in the Hall of Fame. My wife, she pushed for this vacation because a lot of our dates were Craig BGO ball games 20 years ago. <laughs> BGO. It's incredible. The vibe here is crazy. Uh, the people are excited. We finally got one of our guys in, so we just couldn't be happier right now. Welcome back to Craig Biggio, Journey to Cooperstown. One of the first things to greet Astro fans at the Hall of Fame was this Craig Biggio display case featuring memorabilia, not only from his time in the big leagues, but also from his life before baseball. Among the items in Craig's display case, a football trophy from high school. A ring he received upon making his first All-Star team back in 1991. A bat from his final season. And perhaps the most interesting thing, the elbow guard that he was wearing when he broke Don Baylor's modern-day record for being hit by a pitch. You know, if that arm pad could talk, he would probably say, ouch. Of all the records that Craig Biggio holds, the one that probably exemplifies his career the most is the fact that he was hit by a pitch 285 times. It's the way he played the game, with grit, determination, and toughness. Attributes that all permeated that clubhouse for 20 years. It was completely by example, and that's, you know, when you came in, you either played hard, you played his way, you played the Astro way, or you weren't an Astro very long. Cancelosi drops the ball. Biggio makes it without a play at third. He went in hard, though. Casey Candell said to me one day, you know, somebody asked him a question. You know, how do you get your superstar players to play the game the way they play it? And his answer was easy. It's the way you're supposed to play the game. So I don't know what goes on in somebody else's clubhouse. But I know in our clubhouse right here, this is the way you're going to play the game. Roland charging. And 
pick it up. Vigio reaches again. He came to the park ready to play, and that's all he wanted to do is play ball and, and show and lead the way physically and the way he played the game. And with him and Bagwell, the way they played the game, that was like the message to the younger guys on the team. This is how you play Astro baseball. Nothing less. Second baseman Jordan underneath and back, and whoa, he drops it. Vigio's on second base. You know, if he didn't have dirt on his uniforms and he felt like he didn't do anything that day, and that's, that's to me, I think that best describes it. Craig was intense. He was not a guy that joked very much. He didn't, uh, not because he couldn't, he just didn't. He, he was very serious about the game. Part of when people saw him come in a room, I think he garnered a lot of respect for that. And of course, he he was willing to say if a player was out of line, he was willing to call him on the carpet about it. And that's uh, that's what leadership is about. You're accountable. You're accountable for everything. Okay, and it's the way you go out there and you play the game. And uh, it's just uh, it's the way that it's supposed to be. You know, when you're one of the better players on your team, you're supposed to be the guy that's be the leader, not the guy that's only there for when you're going well. You know, and when things aren't going well, you're the one that has to take full responsibility upon the team and kind of deviate that from the younger kid. And he shouldn't have to go through that. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's part of the, um, you know, part of being a leader is, uh, is accountability. This beautiful bridge here in Cooperstown was obviously built for the long haul, built in 1928. You know, in Craig's induction speech, he talked about the baseball life. It's a great life, but it's a hard life. But just like this bridge, it's hard to keep that family together and under a strong foundation without a very important person. The one in his life, his wife, Patty. She was the hitting coach and she was the driver and she was the cook and I mean, we're never home. We're never home for eight months, and I did it. Um, God, we're lucky for to do it for 20 years, 22 years, and count the minor leagues, right? But I mean, uh, to be able to uh, to have the success that I've had on a baseball field, I was able to do because I had a great woman at home. She did an amazing job with our kids, and, and our kids are who they are because of her. Also close to Craig's heart, the Sunshine Kids, a group that helps children with cancer. Craig has worked with them over the last 20 years and flew a handful of them to Cooperstown. He just cares so much. You know, after I met him the first time, he remembered my hobbies and my interests. He remembered what position my brother played in baseball. He remembered what my parents did for a living. Um, he just cares about people. You know, obviously he's great on the field, but I think that's what sort of gives him the extra something, you know, is how great he is off the field. They are one of the reasons why I stayed. I, I'm committed to them and, and uh, to do uh, whatever my role and my part is to help them, to give them a little sunshine in their day, have some fun, lean on them, talk to them, um, and to be able to experience, uh, you know, the Hall of Fame with uh, six to ten of them. I mean, it was that was really, really special. I love those kids and uh, very grateful having the opportunity and blessed to be around them. When we come back to Cooperstown, but his name will forever be linked with Craig Biggio. We'll hear from Jeff Bagwell. And Craig's not the only former Astro to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. In fact, he's not the only former Astro in the class of 2015. We'll hear from the big unit, Randy Johnson, when we return. He said that they, they won every year. What do you think he said? Because why do you think we won every year? So we don't want to go to work. <laughs> most of those guys, after the season was over, they, we, they'd have to go to work and get a job. Yeah. And if well, you played in the World Series different and different you won it, you didn't have to get a job. So it was like, we didn't want to go to work. All the fame players of the day all go to jobs. In the yeah. Summer. Back to Craig Vigia, Journey to Cooperstown. Well, the night before the induction ceremony, the streets of Cooperstown, New York, were filled for the Legends Parade. 49 Hall of Famers returned for Hall of Fame weekend, and most of them took part in the annual trip down Main Street, including former Astros Nolan Ryan and Joe Morgan. And while Vigia might be the first to go in the Hall of Fame as an Astro, He's not the first Hall of Famer to have worn an Astros uniform. 
In total, there are eight other former Astros in the hall. The latest being Randy Johnson, the 2015 inductee, winning as a Diamondback. But his time as an Astro in 1998 for some great memories in his career. There's a strike. He backdoored him, and Roland thought he had a walk. When I got traded from Seattle. Uh, I went to Houston, and that was my best two months of my career. Uh, pitched 11 games and went 10 and 1. This guy, his mentality was like when it was his day to pitch, it was like Sunday's NFL football game. Like, here we go, boys. Arrgh. He's intense, they ain't no messing around. But to watch this guy prepare and get ready for a baseball game and then come out and pitch like he did, man, I had the greatest seat in the house playing defense behind this guy. He was just carving guys up left and right. I mean, I still believe it. I still think we had the best team that beat the Yankees. Um, but we never got there because, you know, we had Kevin Brown in game one and game three, and it just didn't work out in a short series. So, But he was, uh, he was amazing. A couple of constants throughout Craig's career. Obviously, he was always an Astro. Another one was the fact that he just about always played alongside Jeff Bagwell. And Baggy wouldn't have missed his induction for the world. I'm here for one reason, Craig Vigio, because he deserves it. There's a lot of special things. I, I'm excited for Craig. I play with Randy. Pedro's a good friend. I, obviously, everybody knows I played against Smoltz for a long time. So this, this is a special weekend for our family, and, but it all stems from Craig. Teammates for 15 years, Biggio and Bagwell will forever be linked in Astros history. Of Jeff's more than 1,500 runs batted in, 370 were scored by Biggio. As the two mainstays of the Killer Bees led the Astros to six playoff appearances. Be able to change a culture where, you know, people expect us to win and get to the playoffs every year and not hoping, that's really hard to do. But to do it with a guy that, you know, side by side next to me for 15 years, he was an amazing player, Hall of Fame player to me. For him to be there, it meant a lot to me. And because um, we had a lot of fun out there on the baseball field together. Biggio liked to say that they were just two East Coast kids that one day wanted to make it to the World Series. And that dream came true in 2005, Bagwell's final season. To finally be able to do it side by side, it was the right way. I mean, if you're going to write a script, at least it happened. You know what I mean? Rather than maybe he wasn't there or I wasn't there, and one guy got to go and the other guy didn't go. So for me uh, and him, I mean, it was, it was it was everything we thought it would be. Because, you know, you, you watch it as a kid, you read about it, you know, we, he's a Red Sox fan. I was, you know, grew up, had the Yankees and Mets. And then you finally get to experience the whole thing together. I was, it was cool. When we come back, from that magical phone call in January to his enshrinement in July. We'll cover it all with our conversation with the newest Hall of Famer. That's next. Welcome back to Craig Vigio, Journey to Cooperstown. It's known as Induction Sunday, when all of the Hall of Famers give their induction speeches. And most believe that Craig Vigio's was the best they had heard in quite some time. A crowd of over 40,000 on hand loved what they heard. The weekend was a once-in-a-lifetime event. And for many Astros fans, the trip to Cooperstown was a long time in the making. Vigio! Vigio! Red Sox fans told me that they usually show up in numbers and drown out everybody. They said Houston showed up strong and uh, they actually got beat out this time. It's incredible. The Astros fans are definitely outnumbering all the other fans. It's it's great. Uh, um, they're everywhere. <laughs> this is our sixth year in a row that we've been here for induction weekend and I'm overwhelmed by the amount of Astro fans that are here. Um, it's lopsided Astro fans over all the other ones. After the ceremony, many fans made their way back to the Hall of Fame to witness another piece of history. Craig Vigio's plaque was officially placed in the Hall of Fame gallery, not too far from the original class of 1936. 
Well, it's been a whirlwind of activity for Craig since he was elected to the Hall of Fame back in January. Shortly after his induction, I got a chance to visit with the newest Hall of Famer. Is it, has it sunk into you? I mean, is it? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you have six months to prepare for it and get ready for it. Um, you know, when it first originally happened in January, you get the, you're like overwhelmed with so many different things, and, uh, and then you start preparing and you start walking around a town and everybody telling you how excited they are. So when I went up there, I was just like, I'm just gonna enjoy it, and I enjoyed it even more the minute my speech was done and I sat down. <laughs> and I was like, I'm done. Now I can watch the other three guys sweat it out. You were giving a speech. I was wondering how emotional you were going to get. You got a, you got a little emotional when you talked about your parents. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you find, and not to get overly psychological here, but did you think you were going to have trouble when you were looking at your family? Or was that kind of what, what brought you back? Uh, they were the safe zone. Yeah, really? You know, you, you, you know, I mean, you've got 50,000 people out there, and it seems like 30,000 plus were all Astro fans, so that's safety too, you know? Um, but, you know, whenever you're in a pinch, you always look to the people that, you know, okay, if you feel like you're stumbling over your words, look at them, they'll get you back on track again, you know? Just like life. Uh, yeah, right? I, I think we did a really nice team effort. You know, like people said, did you know, did you have somebody professionally write your speech? You're like, no, my wife and I talked about it one day, we organized it, you know, and then Connor typed it all out. And like, 20, it was like, he was a godsend from that standpoint. You know, we covered all the bases and covered all the people we wanted to thank, you know what I mean? Because yeah. there's so many people that had an impact on your life and for you to get there. And I wanted to make sure that we covered them all. I was amazed at how many Astro fans were there. Uh, what that meant to you? Uh, I, I, were you surprised, first of all? A lot of people, you know, it said to me that, you know, we're coming, I'm coming. And then you get up there in the sea of orange and the parade. Even the Hall of Fame said they've never really seen that before, where you have the dominance of, like, one team like that. It's so big, you know? I watched the parade go by, and I'm thinking, that's Henry Aaron. You know what I mean? And Mr. Aaron. That, okay. Well, He's the only guy. I mean, that's Mr. Aaron. I mean, I can't call him Hank. I'll that, never call him Hank. Isn't I mean. that amazing, though? I mean, do you ever, because we're about the same age, growing up and seeing these guys play every yeah. Saturday, and, and, I mean, and there they are. I mean, yeah. do you, you're one of them, but do you have to pinch yourself? Yeah, no, it's crazy. It's crazy um, when you think about it. And, uh, you know, because you think about it. You know, Mr. Aaron and Babe Ruth and, you know, Ted Williams and Nolan Ryan and those are like Hall of Fame guys. And now I get to hang out with them. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's cool. But, I mean, you don't really, you know, you never really perceive yourself that way, but now you're with this group and, and we're hanging out with those guys, man. It's, what a, you know, you're sitting around a table eating dinner with all the Hall of Fame guys and it's just like, man, you know, Ozzy Smith and, you know, Rod Carew and George Brett and, there's no one, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of funny. They had a little Judy table, and then they had the home run table. You know, like, how many home runs do you have, kid? I don't know, 290-something. Now you're a Judy table. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I'll sit in the corner if you want me to. <laughs> I just want to watch and listen. Just, just tell me, I don't care. I'm a rookie on this team. Will you go back to Cooperstown? Every year, yeah. I mean, unless I have something that I have to, that I, uh, a commitment that, um, that I, I can't be at. But, I mean, for me, it's... Uh, Absolutely. Every single year it would be, that's the, the, the biggest honor was that, you know, <laughs> you can ever have is, you know, being a Hall of Famer and, uh, you know, Miss Aaron and all those other guys can come back every year. I think Craig Biggio can go back too. Congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, that's going to do it from historic Cooperstown, New York. I got to tell you, if you're a baseball fan or even if you're not, this is certainly a place that you want to come visit. I'm Kevin Eschenfelder. Thanks for being with us.